Okay, good evening and welcome. I am Lauren Gates, your host of tonight's Airway Health Solutions Conversation Series with my partner in airway health and crime, uh, tonight's airway expert presenter, Dr. Ben Moralia. Welcome, Ben. It's always great to be with you again, discussing our favorite topic, airway dentistry. So it seems like it's been a while, right? Yeah, I think it's been a few months since our last one. Uh, happy to be here. Yeah, thanks everybody for joining us. And uh, yeah. well, we, we got some fun for you. We have a great crowd tonight. We have, um, again, over 200 registrants. So that's always uh, encouraging that airway dentistry is making its mark and people want to learn more. Um, I think we have basically different um, levels from from all aspects of, of dentistry. There's different um, people who signed up. We have hygienists, we have uh, dentists, pediatric dentists, orthodontists, um, sleep uh, uh, SLPs. And I just wanted to take a, a quick poll and see um, in our audience, how many people are currently integrating airway dentistry in the practice. So I'm gonna go ahead and, and try this. I feel like so fancy tonight, but let's give this a shot and see here, um, if you could go ahead and answer, it's a live poll, if you're currently integrating airway dentistry in your practice. Well, the good news is the majority is, and the other good news is that there are other people who are interested in it. So it's a win-win for everybody. Thank you for those who um, took the poll. About 80% um, are already integrating airway dentistry. So the other 20% were really excited to share with you all the benefits and always um, further your knowledge uh, on airway dentistry. So I just wanted to give um, a disclaimer here before we get started um, that the information given is not intended or implied to be a substitute for professional medical or dental advice, diagnosis or treatment, and all contents including text, graphics, images, and information is for general, general purposes only and are the opinions of the speakers. Okay, so we got that out of the way, Dr. Morales. So let's go ahead and kick off because we're going to do a brief overview of how we got here, how so many people have malocclusion. And this is like a lightning speed version of it. We do have the full video. If you're new to airway dentistry and haven't heard you know, the anthropology and the studies behind it, um, we will put that in the chat box for you to uh, watch the full thing. So you really have a, a great foundation. But today we're just gonna do a, a quick overview of the anthropology, how we got here. And for those who have heard this before, it's always great to have a refresher because we're constantly sharing this with our patients and even our family and friends. So why don't you go ahead, we'll kick it off and then we'll have a really robust q and I have a lot of questions here from everybody. So we're, we're all set to rock and roll with the Q&A session and um, let, let's do this. Go ahead, Dr. Ben, let's kick this off. Okay, yeah, there you go. Q&A afterwards, so here we go. All right, let's see, should, uh, I'd like to advance slide. All right, so some of these uh, are of children. So uh, please don't take any photos or images of the kids and stuff. It's not nice, we're trying to their privacy and uh, they have um, faces and ailments that we're not trying to really share all of I have permission to share teaching purposes other people to take the photos and use them. So how do we use a lot of childhood sleep disorder breathing? And then there's a fair amount of adult. And as we're getting more aware and more people are being tested, there's plenty more with more testing. Uh, sleep disorder breathing words in kids, more than OSA. It's not likely that we're gonna sleep test a lot of children. It's rare to do it. Uh, we're mostly focused on their malocclusion or their underdevelopment. And we're gonna build that puzzle right now. The uh, most important part for kids is recognizing that uh, they're not excellent nasal breathers. So we'll call it sleep disorder breathing until you get a full diagnosis. Those words are totally fair. There's a lot of it going around. Children do struggle with a lot of so symptoms that are downstream from poor breathing and sleeping are in these categories. ADHD, upper respiratory infections, ear infections and ear tubes, bedwetting, nightmares, night terrors, learning disabilities, clenching and grinding of the teeth, Rest sleep waking often, small leg growth, anxiety, depression, daytime sleepiness, overweight, night sweats, 
gastrointestinal distal reflux. You know, loosely we use the word reflux, but basically it's a malfunctioning of the digestive system. Emotional instability, mouth breathing. And so those are all symptoms that are related to poor breathing and sleeping, which we can now relate to our jaws. So when we're thinking about uh, the most common malocclusion, we're going to know or find that it's crowding. Crowding exists a lot more than space. So a lot of uh, children come in with that have no spaces and or crowded, dentition that's crowded, and or dentition by the age of 12 and above that needs attention. So our focus will be on the foundation as opposed to the teeth. It's two different pathways. So we're thinking about crowding, you know, in order to crowded teeth, you have to have a, a foundational one. So when you're talking about the foundation delivering the crowded teeth, the foundation would be an improper arch form and an improper arch width. And so when we're thinking about proper arch form and proper arch width, those things do exist. And we, we would take a look at <clears throat> this photograph, see the difference. There's a big difference between proper and arch form. You know, an improper arch form usually we'll refer to it as like a V or mega shaped arch. And it'll be a high vault and a terrible uh, uh, shape for the tongue to fit in. Then we look at the side of the screen and we see, hey, that's a beautiful broad wide arch. That's proper arch form. That's a well-developed maxilla where the tongue actually looks like it made an imprint into the roof of the mouth. So we would have that full upper arch developed, then our tongue has a better place to live. So when we see crowded malocclusions and horrible and the teeth are really, really placed in the bite is full, that's really not a problem. The big problem is the tongue has no room and we might even spill in the nasal chamber having some trouble. So as we think about improper arch form and width, you know, the results of adequate development of the mac and the mandible. Underdeveloped maxilla causes crowding, and underdeveloped maxilla also has an effect on the position of the mandible. So when we think about normal growth, it's wider, forward, and downward. We get predominantly wide and forward growth with a little bit of downward growth. Abnormal growth is any combination of now backward and a lower downward. So if we're not wide, we're narrow. If we're not forward, but we do get downward rotation. The issue with the abnormal growth is most of it's underdevelopment. And when the maxilla is underdeveloped, it's not only that both jaws are underdeveloped, but the narrow underdeveloped maxilla has a secondary effect, which is that it traps the mandible back. So with a trapped mandible in a retruded position, and the mandible has trouble landing appropriately when the maxilla is underdeveloped. So we put our puzzle together, we start thinking, oh, why? Why are the maxilla and the mandible underdeveloped? So there's a reason why almost kids we would meet today have underdeveloped jaws. And the reason we could say almost all is because it's very rare for a child to grow up from primary teeth to mixed dentition to permanent dentition. And then don't forget the last step, which is to erupt the wisdom teeth into fin. So for a child to grow all the way on their own, land their wisdom teeth, have like a textbook class one that we would all say is healthy and you know stable good long time that's a rare child that's why we can say almost all are underdeveloped jaws get that an answer from anthropology research so as soon as you start to dig into anthropology research you come across a dr robert corcini dr robert corcini is not only an anthropologist but specifically head and focused he's a major anthropist he has almost four decades of research books journals a lot of uh, excavation sites where the fossils are measured and dated and, of course, generations backward and forward are studied, uh, and that becomes some really important information. Then we get some animal testing in there and even some twin studies to show where does malocclusion come from, and then he has a book that has all of the information right in it. So this book is uh, a must-read one in the dental that is pursuing the airway uh, dentistry pathway. If you're getting into a sleeping, breathing, malocclusion of underdeveloped jaws, you want to have this book and go through how anthropology informs the, di the orthodox diagnosis of malocclusion causes. That's a power title. How anthropology informs the orthodontic diagnosis of malocclusion causes. Malocclusion has a cause, and Dr. Corcini and other anthropologists worldwide know what it is. So from Dr. Corcini and others, we learned that prior to 400 years ago, there's little to no malocclusion in the face and that the jaws grew fully, 32 teeth were represented, and there was no variation, little to no variation. So where you went around the world, you found human beings 400 years ago that had fully developed jaws, and their teeth really close to where they belong with 32 of them represented. Then, of course, they start 
kind of watching and hacking population studies over time. And in the traveling of the world, the studying isolated rural people, they learn feedings followed by a hard diet. And this becomes the single most important factor in what introduces occlusion or underdevelopment into a culture is that breastfeeding followed by a hard diet basically uses the musculature appropriately so the jaws can develop uniformly. And no matter what culture you explore, when they have that early hard diet, they all grow beautifully, develop jaw 32 teeth. There's little to no evidence of malnutrition or inflammatory or degenerative diseases in cultures pre the industrial or diet. There's little to no variation, no matter who you are on the planet, digging up and measuring skulls. They develop jaws with 32 teeth in place. And then they start to study population. They become exposed to Western cultures. And so malocclusion doesn't really exist until the introduction of that early kind of soft thanks to the Western change. So the animal studies are, are pursued immediately. They start to learn about, hey, what does it mean to change the consistency of the food? We do hard soft diet studies, the results are always the same. Soft diets will end up with spotty mass, less than that's body was the jaws. And of course, the soft early, smaller musculature. The muscle response to so form follows function. With smaller, weaker oral musculature, you end up with a narrower maxilla, a smaller mandible, a thinner out smaller condyles, even kind of smaller than the mandible shrinking. So basically the early soft diet deliver weak and dysfunctional musculature, which then have the ability or func proper function to develop the jaws to their full size. So what we learned is prevalence by the generation rather rapidly. As anthropology research shows cultures that have broken isolation would have food. And so food become the, the trades, the first generation after exposure to prepared, processed, preserved foods, a softer diet, malocclusion shows up at about 50%. But it grows rapidly. The second generation, the malocclusion raises to 70. By the 85 and the fourth, it breaks 90. So we break 90 malocclusion rates in a population in generations, which is really only 80 years for cultures that were one dated and not trading food. So cultures that have food follow the breastfeeding begins at six old, that hard diet. Uh, they don't have this issue. Then of course, once we use that soft diet to the early ages between zero and two years old, all of a sudden we're gonna have weaker mother, dysfunctional musculature, and we don't get the development. So what they also recognize variation. And by variation, that means class one, two, three, crossbite on the right, nope, on the left, bilateral crossbite, deep bite, open bite, jet, negative over jet. All of these things mixed and bind together. The variation from the muscle dysfunction. Muscle weakness and dysfunction deliver underdeveloped that have variable connections, so to speak, which we label with all our fancy words describing the type of malocclusion or the patient has. And meanwhile, this is all from the early off diet, delivering these changes very rapidly. So when we think about, hey, the children are seventh generation. So they're seventh generation post-Western industrial change to the early soft diet. So when you're seventh generation, you think about, well, the parent is, the grandparent is fifth, the great grandparent is fourth. So it's pretty good sense that the parents and grandparents all kind of have malocclusion and you think generations in your practice you got to go back a long way. And even in grandparents today, you'd recognize, hey, grandparents have pretty good rates of malocclusion because they would be in the fifth generation. So we talk about anthropology research. They do have, you know, all common, uh, all common conclusions that tarry consistency and tough promote proper growth and proper production, bringing about ideal. When non-resistant problems become ubiquitous after industrialism and the erupting and cuspal coordination of lose the critical of vigorous masticatory pressures on a rapid rise. Occlusion uh, people, the anthropology get together with the talk about and get to an example of genetics. Uh, this begs the next question. What are the results of having an underdeveloped maxilla and mandible? It's not just the, the bad bite, those problems or symptoms of what well, jaws deliver, but they're not really problems we have. When we remember that the maxilla doesn't just hold, it actually forms a nasal chamber. 
uh, then we pay closer attention to what's going because a human being is an obligate nasal breather. So as an obligate nasal breather, you think about being able to breathe well. Well, bad things happen when you can't breathe well through the nose. Without the maxilla, when we look at the roof of the palate, the palate is also the floor of the nose. So it is the floor of the nose and the maxilla will have a vaulted palate. It begins to fold up. Of course, it's collapsing up. So the floor of the nose is rising. Well, that's like a compactor You're taking effect, shrinking cavity. But lateral or maxilla, maxilla makes up the lateral walls of the chamber. So since the mac makes up the lateral walls of the nasal chamber, those are coming in. So the floor of the nose is rising and the walls are caving in. Basically, the nidia is shrinking and end there. As the vault is rising, the septum in between is under pressure and it will inside. So you will have a curvature and or full deviation of a septum when you have an underdeveloped maxilla. So the underdeveloped maxilla delivers a smaller nape with a curved and or deviated septum, end up with one bad nostril and one worse. The moment you have nasal airflow resist triggers mouth breathing. So really soft diet, the muscle and dysfunction, which deliver underdeveloped jaws and the difficult breathing through the nose translates into now we have mouth breathing. Mouth breathing, the cause of the underdeveloped jaws, it's an adding of fuel onto that's already started. The soft diet is the cause of the underdeveloped jaws. Soft food delivers malocclusion, but in the mal malocclusion in the maxilla, what tough breathing through the nose, which means mouth breathing. Mouth breathing adds fuel to a fire already raging. Now, this is just a fruit. underdeveloped jaws deliver a difficulty breathing. But also, when the maxilla is underdeveloped, it's not as so. When the maxilla is not as far forward, if the maxilla is further back, there will be less color here. So, when we think about airway, you know, airway is a loose word describing a so more it would be called the nasal cavity. The nasopharynx, the oropharynx, the laryngopharynx. So we've got these. Well, if you can think about the maxilla growing forward better color, is backward or not growing forward, you have less color. Well, less color means less room for air. Most of the time, when the maxilla developed, the mandible's trapped behind it. All class ones and twos, the mandible is further back. Class three patient has the maxilla, has the mandible escape forward into a forward position, made to the maxilla. When the mandible's back in every class one and two that is underdeveloped, the tongue is back. So we have a compromise that could be into the oropharynx, laryngopharynx. So basically the underdeveloped set of jaws delivers a reduced air and then a time in the breathing. So when we have two 10 year olds we might meet, there's a 10 year old on the screen here that has very good wider and forward growth and a beautiful heart and hose to breathe through behind it. The nostril would flow the nasal chamber, then the air goes into the nasopharynx, oropharynx, and laryngopharynx. It's a wide open chamber flow. So that child would have symptoms. You have a child who can have lip seal and sleep and breathe beautifully and not have any symptoms. As we take, you know, a list of symptoms from children about the child on the right, that's pretty much all of the symptoms. Age of two, this child has well. So the I'm in the nose. Maxilla, we'd have a compromise in cavity, but then also in the nasopharynx or laryngopharynx. This stirring straw. Now, what is on the inside is also on the side. Their jaws are growing differently. One child has forward growth, the other child has no forward growth. So you would expect that child to have an aromize. Craziest thing about these, they're both class one. They both have a class one bite, which Today means you know little to nothing when we're considering it's the jaw growth and development that's the key to your health, not whether you're class one, two, or three. So that child on the right, obviously those jaws growing wider and forward to be able to produce a better, a better sleeper and reduce in that child. So about the child that has an underdeveloped set, which is all the children who have a soft diet early, which is pretty much today, we have sleep disorder breathing as the result. What we talk about is Sleep disorder, their breathing, being any tough breathing, snoring, upper air distance, all the way to OSA. Basically, you are disorder breathing if you are not being silent and invisible nasal breathing. So the only healthy category for a human being to be breathed silent and invisible nasal breathing, and those words are loose. What we would really like to have is distant nasal airflow. 
So non-resistant nasal airflow delivers a healthy human. Anything else, there's nasal airflow resistance, it triggers in the lip seal, and then we'll start to breathe through their mouth. With the decrease in nasal breathing, it does change uh, human beings' biochemistry and physiology, and mostly because of the balance in carbon dioxide, oxygen, and nitric oxide. When those three are out of balance, thanks to a decrease in nasal breathing and an increase of breathing, it changes everything about a human being and it starts pushing us in a healthy category. When we do breathe poorly, whether it's nasal airflow resistance or we're all the way to OSA, basically at night when you go to sleep, you are now having sleep fragmentation or disruption of repair cycles instead of a proper sleep cycle and a well-rested, rejuvenated being. A fragmented sleep or disrupted sleep cycle for unhealthy children who become unhealthy adults. Nobody outgrows this issue. When we think of genetics, well, the anthropology research takes a turn down the genetic route right away because immediately they know, hey, this is a early soft diet causing the type of trouble. And so they reach out and learn about genetics right away. And that when you have uh, every anthropology study done show that you can have a malocclusion of 50% in the first generation, uh, all of a sudden they want to ask the genetic community, hey, what could the genes you know, role be? And the genetic community knows that that is a very significant hold, 50%, uh, a rate of 50% when it was near zero. So in the genes, when it, what it happens, the genetic community shares with the anthropology community, uh, any human being or any, any uh, trait that humans have near zero, uh, near a zero, but then it's 50% of the population. For genes to change human beings' traits from near zero to existing in half the population, it's a 27,000 year process. So basically to take a trait like malusion that has a near zero rate and then becomes percent in one generation, which is 20 years, it's impossible for it to be in the genes because it take 27,000 years to produce a trait from a near zero to a 50% rate in human beings. So we know it, but in the genes, and then of course we have a lot of identical twin search going through the anthropology in the early soft diet to go ahead and show the combination of the two and where it really is. It's in the the food source and then so we a lot of children and this would be a nine-year-old's in and of course they have a malocclusion with a little face symmetry going on there and then profile photograph shows a lack of lip seal and an underdeveloped profile as well and then we could see the crowding in the mixed dentition so we have a crowded malocclusion that has that v-shaped arch high vault and of course we're going to have crowded but we're also going to with the underdeveloped have a compromised airway so the class two style over jet, lack of lip seal, narrow V-shaped arches, you know, this is not a tooth problem or a symptom. This is a foundational problem. So the child will have a list of symptoms and difficulty breathing. What's interesting about this is that he's an twin. So when you're identical twin and you take these photos five minutes apart, same day, same office, five minutes apart, you could see they don't look alike. They're not even the same. So they're several inches different in height. And next thing you know, they don't even look alike, yet they're identical twins. So this, you know, is an example of if you've ever had to meet identical twins, they have what these uh, two share, which is a mild malocclusion on the left and a severe on the right. So it's not that the left side of the screen is well-developed, it's just a mild malocclusion. And as mild, one as severe, but when you don't breathe and sleep well, change in how you grow and develop. So now you've got these identical twins don't look alike. And sure enough, they have slightly different profiles. And then, of course, slightly days. Okay, the mild amount on the left and a on the right. And what if you do? So, if we treat the child with the severe malocclusion and start to grow the arch, change foundation and open up the arch, develop a lot of width, start to improve all of the things that go into getting back to nasal breathing. All of a sudden, as you're developing the arches and things are much wider, the tongue's more room, the teeth start to align well. And next thing you know, you have a bigger foundation that's shaped more like the tongue shaped in there, not a V anymore. But what that does is it changes the face. So when you go ahead and you change the foundation, the maxilla and the mandible, then you get a different human being who all of a sudden has lip seal at rest, can nose breathe. And when you can nose breathe, all of a sudden you sleep better. When you sleep better, children get growth hormone released better. He crashes up to his twin. So all of a sudden they start to look like again and have similar facial features. And all you have to do is treat the one child who's in the severe category to get them looking alike. So it's the same thing anthropology knows 
is that delusion is not in your genes, it's an acquired trait, and it is a disease of Western society. In particular, the early site delivers weakness and dysfunction, which delivers the lack of job growth and development, giving us variable malocclusions of the human race. Then we meet kids who are older, and some of them come in at about 19 years old. So if you meet a 19-year-old, you still have to help them out. Suffering with malillusion, having TMD, having sleep disorder breathing. Uh, there's a lingual frenum issue here. We talk a lot about frenum diagnosing, and releasing, because it's part of the problem. And then, of course, maybe clear aligner therapy can help out an older child or adult. So when we meet uh, this patient, we learn about the history that uh, she had braces for several years, and then at age 16, ends up at the TMD office being treated for her jaw pain, mostly headache. So the history we learn is that the braces are for four years. The TMD pain and headache enduring ortho. She has no history of any TMD pain or headaches prior to uh, receiving orthodontics with bracket and wire technique. Then of course the jaw clicking and popping starts. Uh, the braces are removed around 15 years old. At age 16, she's in a TMD specialist being treated and her main concern is the, the weekly headaches that are, are her. So she gets to about 15 years old, goes to college. The headaches are still persistent and has to leave school to come back home to try to find a solution. And then we, we are at age 19, finds our office. So this is how she uh, appeared. And here we go at age 19. This is her, you know, after having uh, almost four years in braces, this is the type of bite that she has. This is not a tooth issue. This is a foundational issue. So when we take a look at someone like this, they're very narrow. They have a, an omega-shaped arch, a high vault. And of course, there's crowding and malocclusion. Uh, the upper arch is incredibly narrow. We're going to get involved with removable expansion for patients like this. 19 and above, we tend to use removable expansion appliances with a beautiful technique. You can grow the jaws. Uh, and this is first five millimeters of upper jaw growth and development right here. So then we switch into some clear aligners. But with the first five millimeters, then you go a couple more. Basically, you're looking at this is a 27 millimeter transverse measurement, the distance between three and 14 turning into 34. And this is after using just removable two screw airway appliance. That removable expander axilla here by seven millimeters. Then we're going to switch into clear line, develop a little room around those peg upper laterals. And then next thing you know, we're here. We've placed some posit on the both laterals that were under this. So a 10 millimeter change. This is a 27 millimeter transverse measurement to 37. The first seven millimeters are with the removable expansion appliance. The next three are with the clear aligners to continue the growth and development. And next thing you know, you've got this full wide open chamber. And then of course the lower teeth are receiving uprighting. So they come out, they come all the way out of where their position is that they belong and they're fully upright and open. We have more room for our tongue. So you've got the patient here and with whitening gel in the aligners, you see it has a nice effect. But only the only teeth that are worked on seven and 10 as far as composite undersized. So composites were placed on seven and 10, the position where the patient has no symptoms. So basically as the first few weeks are going by and the maxilla begins to grow a little bit, the headaches begin to reduce and by about nine months, the headaches are completely gone. And here's the difference between a patient on the left who is struggling and a patient on the right who is thriving. So the patient on the left has all the muscle tension has the headaches weekly, takes her out of college, back home. And then of course you can see the development of the maxilla, the change in that foundation. This was not about tooth alignment, that was secondary to the maxillary growth and development, same thing with the lower jaw. So you grow the bone first, then you align the teeth second, and that's what delivers an asymptomatic patient with no more headaches. Uh, we completed her five years ago. So she is now five years headache free. She ended up returning to school, finished her uh, college, got her master's, she's a special education teacher now and uh, working and happy and having no symptoms. Uh, we check her every six months. She wears a clear retainer to bed every night. Hasn't had a headache in five years, not a single headache in five years. And that she suffered with from 16 to 18, three straight years of them. So this also included frenum revision. You know, the lower lingual frenum was tight. And if you want the tongue to occupy the space you're developing, you got to release that frenum and you got to include some myofunctional therapy so you can get uh, the tongue taut and strengthened and functioning properly to help again with further, you know, improvements in the airspace. When we think about uh, teenagers, sometimes we can use just clear aligners alone. So we meet a child like this who is very narrow, 17 years old, gets to the junior year of high school. Uh, he had escaped braces, so he did not have any, but now he knows, you know, this isn't my best smile. Uh, my two front teeth are a little buck teeth look. I, I don't want to smile like this, but I also don't want to go to school wearing braces junior and senior year. 
So I'm here for clear aligner. So we meet him and here he is completely collapsed. And this come a terrible occlusion deteriorate over time. And then of course the lower arch is collapsed with the premolar leaning in there and the upper arch is that omega or V shaped arch, very narrow, uh, terrible arch form, terrible arch width, you know, wildly underdeveloped. So this is what it looks like just to have a good clear aligner technique. If you have a good clear aligner technique, you can do this in 12 months. So this is 12 months of clear liners opening up that tongue. And when you do expand beautifully and shape that arch nicely, so the tongue can fit in it well, it's gonna change how that child's tongue positioning and functioning. And you'll recognize all the teeth are there. Uh, this case is treated without IPR. We don't do any interproximal reduction when we're doing you know, nice expansion. It doesn't involve IPR. It's not a tooth removal technique. It's a tooth you know, movement technique. Here you can recognize that all the teeth are in place, including our famous 29. Tooth number 29 was our favorite tooth of 2010. Uh, and so I treated him in 2010. He's now 11 years out of treatment. So we spent 12 months developing his arches and now 11 years out of treatment and only does is wear a clear aligner to bed every night. So with beautiful arch development without any IPR, you can have this. And that beautiful dento alveolar growth protects all the gum tissue on both corridors. So you have a wonderful amount of expansion. It's not even about the teeth anymore. It's about the look of the alveolar bone and the maxilla is bigger now. So you have this beautiful development of the arch, plenty of room for the tongue and a different human being afterwards. So now that you've got this fully developed broad wide smile that is his own natural teeth with just some whitening gel and clear aligner technique, all of a sudden you've got this kid who looks like this, confident, happy, he can smile, can go out and have social you know, interactions, whether it's in school or out of school. Six months later, you know, take another photograph and all of a sudden a little different hairstyle, a little different facial. You know, he's feeling really good about himself. He's going to the gym, he's working out. He's got a great casual smile that shows a mouthful of teeth. In a nice, easy smile, he shows all of the teeth, which is, you know, how human beings should look, full, broad, wide arch. And then the important part, the profile, you know, what does that unraveling do for the profile? Well, it makes a big difference in the VDO, especially when you're collapsed in that deep bite. So before treatment with that narrow deep bite, it not only traps the mandible back, but it also allows them to overclose. So with a with an excess lingual inclination of the posterior teeth, the bite will be overclosed and the lower lip will roll out evert. So lower lip eversion produces 90 degree angle at the lower lip to the chin. So this is overclosed and retracted. As soon as we widen and upright all back teeth, it opens up a proper VDO. Now the lip form is perfectly normal and natural all the way down. And now his, his whole entire lip, lip to chin is forward positioning here. So now you have someone who has lip seal at rest without many, many, any muscle activity, he can breathe through his nose, he can sleep well, he's a very healthy human being. Plenty room for the tongue, better nose breathing, um, beautiful result where you have a human being that can breathe through their nose for the entire night and that will change it a human being as well. Very good to sleep through the night with your lips sealed with silent and invisible breathing. When we think about the benefits of minor therapy relating to airway health, well, you can change the morphology, fancy word for shape, of the arch form. A V or an omega-shaped arch does not accommodate the tongue very well, and when you don't accommodate the tongue very well, it can only be in one location, referred to it as posteriorly displaced. So if the arch is a OV or omega shaped arch, you're going to have basically a retracted or retruded or posteriorly displaced tongue. That's in all the research we find those words, posterior displacement of the tongue or posterior displaced tongue, sleep breathing disorder uh, research. You get an increase in oral cavity volume. So the when we think about tongue space and tongue home, that's loose, but oral cavity volume is significant in that the more room your tongue has, the more forward and higher it can be. So if you can have your per tongue placement be in great shape, and then the, you know, the second level to this getting involved frenum revisions were indicated in myofunctional therapy. Orofacial myofunctional therapy helps to retrain all of the head and neck muscular, including the tongue, so that they behave properly and they're not either weak, dysfunctional, or in compensating mode. So if you could properly function, properly strengthened, non-compensating musculature of the head and neck, you're a good breather, you'll breathe well day and night, and it's the nighttime breathing that really delivers the rest and retention uh, a perfect sleep cycle. So basically with the opening up of the maxillary arch, it allows for the mandibular advancement or release of the mandible from its trapped position. And you saw the profile photos uh, of the patient there where that makes the big difference. So just to give you a quick example, which, you know, this is like a tease only because we teach this fully in, I uh, believe it's the advanced course maybe. Uh, this is a, a senior old male 
16 year old female who was never treated because the uh, consultation all involved uh, four bicuspid extracts and the parents didn't want to take any teeth out. So the mom refused to take out teeth and this girl gets 16 until she finds us. And when she finds us, of course, uh, this goes back, she's 23 now. So this goes back a ways, but um, at age 16, when she was in, we're at a point where we have teeth out. I haven't been a tooth out of any human being for orthopedic, chronic therapy, teen strips. So I understand now it's not need the treated. It just be two fixed spanners in a row. So I fixed expand through the team until about 17, 18. Then somewhere around 20, we switch over to movable expansion appliance we saw in the previous case. So what you're looking at, what it'll take fixed expand to develop these arches. It takes two in a row. Here's what it looks like for the upper. That's the first of fixed expansion. We had to go through two to get that child all the way out because when you have that narrow and undeveloped maxilla, you got to really develop that maxilla. So here's what you're looking at is the transition, just to kind of tease it, because we do teach the case in our this course. This is what it looks like after two rounds of fixed expansion and then the start of the clear liners. So now that we've got the liners cooking along, you can see it's a very big change in the maxillary vault and also the size of the maxilla. And that's an accomplishment in a short amount of time to then begin your clear liner technique. The lower arch similar had to go through two fixed expanders to get to this point. At least now at this point, you recognize we're just in clear liner phase for full alignment to finish the job. Now the patient has the full home and chamber for the tongue. Next thing you know, you got a better breather on your hands, a better sleep on your hands and a healthier human being. So symptoms fade away. You deliver more room for the tongue and better breathing through the nose. And even a child like that who has, you know, whatever kind of crowding you want to call that where full teeth are blocked out of the arch, multiple teeth blocked out of the arch in each arch, it can be resolved with using uh, a beautiful expansion technique. And it's all about the foundation first and teeth second. So if you have a foundation first, teeth second approach, the kids that you treat can not only keep all of the first 28, but they can erupt their wisdom teeth into function as they get to 17 and 18 years old. So we're, we're happy to report that uh, the further we get into this and the further along the kids are going and developing, most of the kids that we treat erupt and function, uh, erupt their wisdom teeth into function. So we have our children who we treat with 32 teeth and only rarely do we have to send one to have wisdom tooth removal now. It is a collaborative care process. It's not just me. I've got a whole team at my office, but uh, most of the patients we treat see an oral facial myofunctional therapist. Sometimes there's a speech language pathologist involved. My favorite referral for the kids, uh, teens and adults who are looking to make a big difference in how they breathe and sleep and grow and develop is the orofacial myofunctional therapist. And we have um, world-class um, people who are working with us on this in uh, Carice Laguerre and, and Brittany Sierra. So we use the ENT occasionally. You know, there are some adults that have a deviated septum that is so bad they can't breathe through a nostril at all. Every now and then you send an adult to the ENT to look at that deviated septum. Maybe correction is important for better breathing. Uh, the ENT for kids is more of a um, diagnostic approach. Let's get a scope in there and tell us about the tunnels and adenoids. How big are those? What are we up against? Uh, rarely do we take them out. You know, content removal when you have, you know, a compromised undersized airway isn't the answer. That's not a treatment of the cause and content removal often doesn't result in a solution. So it's more about the growth and development of the jaws and their return to nasal breathing, which can shrink the tonsils and adenoids. So only rarely do we remove them, but it's nice to know what we're up against. Sometimes an oral surgeon or anybody like a periodontist, oral surgeon or general dentist, pediatric dentist, anybody who wants to get involved in frenum revisions, you could make a referral if you don't want to do that yourself. Uh, if you want to get a laser and do it yourself, terrific. If not, you got to find someone who can do it. Every now and then we incorporate the pediatrician, primary care physicians into treatment, depending upon the sleep diagnosis, depending upon, you know, what else might be involved in helping the child. And, you know, more recently, chiropractors, physical therapists, osteopaths, craniosacral people, you know, all the, all the adjunct and auxiliary uh, care that can be delivered to get back to normal and uh, non-compensated muscle behavior and strength in the head and neck and throughout. So you don't have a cascading effect of soft tissue dysfunction in the jaws leading to neck and back and then hip and knee. It can get all the way down the body if you let it go sideways. There is a great video on um, the story of, this is a YouTube video. So you go to YouTube and you look up the story of headgear. Basically, it's a six and a half minute uh, public service announcement done by lay people uh, that highlights the difference between uh, extraction, retraction, or techniques, 
and enhance orthodontic techniques. And it does so with all the research in the orthodontic literature for the last few years. So you have a tremendous opportunity here for education of uh, yourselves, your teams, and the families that you treat in your communities. This is a wonderful YouTube video. I would encourage everyone to go watch that. So you've got this story of headgear, YouTube video, the website, then after that is the right to go.org. That's where all the research is actually there uh, for you to see. If you didn't catch it when you watch the video, it's all cited on the screen. But if you want to go back and look at it, it's there. Uh, wonderful public service announcement so that parents know there's an opportunity for non-extraction therapy. It does exist. There is such a thing as expansive technique, uh, orthodontics and orthopedics. And it's what I've been doing for nine years now. And we don't have a single uh, with the, any extractions and the wisdom teeth. Most of them come into function now. So we're happy about that as well. So that is the shot out of a cannon overview of what we usually spend days teaching. So we break that out into a, you know full days of teaching so that you would really learn you know all of the details needed to have a full understanding. But that's about as fast as I could do that in about 35 minutes. So you have uh, some sort of understanding of the manner in which I practice and treat all of my patients, whether they're three years old, all the way to you know any age, you name it. We have a foundation for tooth second approach and all of it geared towards developing a better breather. And then of course the list becomes nasal breathing is at the top. Then we would like proper tongue function, proper head and neck function. And then, you know, last but not least, the beautiful illusion too. You can have it all. You know, it, it's not if you choose one way, you don't get the other. So in the end, you can develop a beautifully healthy oral cavity with a better airway and a better breather. And you can see symptoms kind of fade away from whether it's a child, teen or an adult. Wow, <laughs> that was that was incredible. You covered so much in such a short period of time. And, um, you know, the cases really say um, a million words. So it's so amazing to see how you've helped those patients really breathe, sleep and thrive. And there's thousands of patients like that. And and the doctors who are on here who are doing this, they know because they've done it themselves and it gets it, it's addicting in a way. Right. You just can't you don't have enough yeah. time. And that's why you want to teach your techniques so other people can can learn as well. Um, we do have a lot of questions that I want to address before we get to sure. some of our updates as well, because a lot of the questions have to do with our updates. But let's just go right to the um, direct chat. Um, does expansion during growth spurts enable the condyles to get larger? Well, usually it's the high that's going to do that. When you start, to, it's the, the condyle size is undersized thanks to the equally soft diet. So if your cause of your undersized mandible and condyle is soft tissue weakness and dysfunction, then the solution is muscle work. And so that's what the oral facial myofunctional therapy is. So when you get involved with expansion appliances, you're helping the foundation to grow and catch up. But when you talk about adding the friend and releases in myofunctional therapy, now you start to train muscle to function appropriately at the appropriate strength without compensating muscles getting involved. Now you have the opportunity to let the, allow the muscles to do the work. And in a human being, uh, bone does yield to muscle and form follows function. So it's one of the reasons why the... Um, the reasons why the myofunctional therapy is kind of critical for children. And so we try to send every single child into a myofunctional therapy referral and program. And when they do get involved in that, now you're including all of the pieces of the puzzle to generate full maxillary and medullary jaw growth and development. And it's not just from the expanders. So the expanders are one piece of the puzzle. The friend and revisions, myofunctional therapy are huge pieces of the puzzle. Last but not least, nasal breathing, a correction from mouth to nose breathing is another, which means nasal hygiene becomes part of the puzzle. You've got to get a clean, empty nose as you're doing all this work to make sure the child converts from mouth breathing to nose breathing. So when you do the collaborative care routine, you can have the full growth of the maxilla and the mandible. And basically a well-developed human being will have 32 teeth come to place without an issue. Now, how does she break the, you need a night guard diagnosis? How do you break the, you need a night guard diagnosis? Well, the, the clenching and grinding and worn enamel, it's, it's, it's not as hard as, it, as you think. Basically what you're looking at, when the same signs that you see that think, oh, I have a night guard to protect those teeth, those are exactly the same signs that scream, have a sleeping and breathing disorder. So the idea would be, you can have the same list of symptoms, worn enamel, uh, 
worn dentin, uh, the pocketing or the erosion in the dentin, the dipping or the cuspal dipping into the dentin, the molar, premolar teeth. You can think about you know, anything from abfraction to recession, uh, tooth sensitivity. You know, all of the things you would think about, hey, periodontal loss, gum loss, bone loss, pocketing, uh, uncontrollable periodontal disease, or even with good effort and good diet, it's not improving very much. The list of symptoms that you think about, hey, the patient is clenching and grinding, and a lot of this is causing this damage that you see, these are all symptoms. That's the same list of symptoms that is tagged with poor and poor sleeping. And so the person who is clenching and grinding their teeth that we would want to make a night guard for, most of those, the cause of the clenching is poor airflow. And so the, the compromised airway triggers the oral cavity musculature to behave in a way to reposition the tongue so that you can improve the airflow. So all of that research comes from Dr. Gerald Simmons uh, and others. He's the main one I learned it from. So when you're thinking about the clenching and bending related to sleeping and breathing, it really is poor breathing is a cause of clenching and grinding for most human beings. And so the idea that Dr. Gerald Simmons, triple board certified out of Stanford, now has Houston Sleep Center, uh, him and others understand that when there's nasal airflow resistance, obviously air pressure and flow issues on, musculature is going to be given a way to improve it. It's a protective mechanism. We call it bruxism or clenching and grinding, but basically a body trying to get better breathing going on. When you improve the breathing, you can reduce the clenching and grinding. So um, I haven't made a night guard in more than 10 years for anybody. I don't make night guard splints or anything like that. I treat the bruxers and or the team patients with growth and development. That's the path to a solution for them. And so I learned it from Dr. Gerald Simmons. I would encourage you to get in front of him because uh, we've had him as a guest. We have a podcast with him. Uh, we've had a meeting with him, a conversation with him. And he does travel around different meetings that are airway related. He does speak dental meetings. I would encourage everyone in front of him and see. Basically, he showed it both ways, that if you have a compromised airway, you're more likely to clench grind. And then if you uh, improve the airway, you can stop the clenching and grinding, almost like a light switch going on and off. So the patient who does the, shows you symptoms that you think a night guard indicated, it's it'd probably be more appropriate to treat in the cause category. So night guard is now a treat the symptom category. So I, I don't like to treat symptoms. I try to stay away from treating symptoms. It's not very rewarding in the long run. So I'm trying to treat in the cause category. Treating the cause delivers patients who never get a night guard again or ever get one, you know, their first one. And also it takes the TMD patient out of their splints and orthotic, any other appliances you might've made in the past, you can stop making those too. So you have a patient then who's better, sleep better. With full maxillary development comes a better jaw position and you can solve a lot of problems. All you have to do is take records and share it with your patient. And then you're, you're given choices. It doesn't mean it's bad to make a night guard. It's just in the treat, the symptom versus treat the cause category. And you'd, you'd be surprised that patients will say, yes, bigger treatment plan. When you show them, here's what's available to you, treating more of the cause than the symptom, you know, the night guard only gets beat up or you haven't changed the cause of anything there. So why keep making night guards when you could do a better treatment plan and treat the cause? When do you, when to use removable and when to use fixed appliances? So I'm a big fan of fixed expanders all the way through the teen years now. We've gotten up to about 17, 18 with no trouble at all. And that is without surgical assistance or without anything uh, auxiliary added to it. So um, older teenagers respond very well to fixed expanders. It just is a little deviation in the technique. So I have a, a very slow technique with the fixed expanders. You can get great bone growth. Uh, and you saw all of examples of that right there in quick slides. So, you know, obviously we teach this in a bigger format ways for those who want to learn full technique. When you hit that 19, 20 year old, I prefer to use removable at that point. Removable expanders work great, provided you have a good technique. So again, depending upon the technique and compliance with that technique, if it's rigidly adhered to, you can get beautiful bone growth. If it's not, the expander just doesn't fit after a while. You see tooth tipping instead of jaw bone growth. So we, we teach a really nice technique that you can get excellent bone growth at almost any age. And, uh, you know, that removable target for me is about 19 to 20. So fixed expanders, always done in a pair. It's an upper and a lower. Having an upper expander only is near useless. Uh, having an upper and a lower paired together can give you the changes that you need to develop not only the 28 tooth mark, but really the 32. Is what's, you know, you start considering what is a human being. A developed human being has 32 teeth. 
So we may as well get back where we're supposed to be. And having a pair of expanders makes the difference. Having an upper only doesn't usually do much because you can't go generate a fully grown upper jaw with a lower coming along. So in, up, uh, my experience is that the kids who walk in and have had an upper only haven't really had growth and development and they're still undersized and get two expanders to get them on track to where they need to be. Okay. And then clear aligner therapy, the question is it expands three to four millimeters and expansion appliances four to five millimeters. No, there's no rule to the numbers. The idea of the one case we showed today was that 19 year old girl or a removable expansion appliance. I showed a picture at the five millimeter mark, but we went all the way to seven. So the removable expander for her delivered seven millimeters, 27 to 34. With the clear aligners, we took it another three and got her up to 37. But I have used clear aligners to go to six and eight millimeters of change in the maxillary uh, transverse measurement with clear aligner technique is wonderful. You, you just need a good technique. You know, clear aligners aren't a miracle on their own. You need the right technique with it. And if you have an expansive technique with your clear aligners, you could do wonderful things. If you use clear aligners with a retractive technique, you can do the same horrible things that braces do by retracting and distalizing stuff and don't really help anybody get into a beautiful occlusion with tongue space. So the idea behind clear aligners is it's not about how many millimeters, you know, you're unraveling that malocclusion until there's no crowding, proper tongue space and nose breather on your hands. So you're developing the dento alveolar arch. The difference between the removable expansion appliance and the clear aligners is really where are you getting your change? The clear aligner world is dento alveolar, but in the removable expander, it's sutural. So the removable expansion appliance has a little more power to give you better bone growth at the sutures, whereas your clear aligner technique is be dento alveolar mostly. So that's the real difference there. It's not about the numbers that you can get from either one. You can get a lot of numbers from either one. What do you say to people, professionals, who say you cannot expand adults? Yeah, so it turns out that's a full myth. And all you have to do is get a stack of orthopedic, uh, your orthopedic surgeon textbooks on that. And you go right to, um, you know, bone dynamics. And then you learn the difference between the skull and the maxilla. And it, that's where the, the difference is really highlighted. Go back to all of those books on bone dynamics and bone growth and development. And the skull, the sutures in the skull go through full fusion. And so the, the skull sutures begin their fusion process at age two to three because the brain is like 80% grown at age two. And they take 20 years, they take a good two decades, two and a half decades for full fusion. And the, the sutures are where two bones meet. But when you have three bones meet, it's called a fontanelle. There's one at the front and back. That's the last part that fuses. And that's why it takes all two decades to get that last little triangle to kind of come together and fuse. Basically the skull bones go through full fusion. But the maxilla, all the sutures of the maxilla mature, they don't fuse. That's a bad word when it comes to the maxilla. So the maxilla is, that is a dynamic bone for the first six decades of life. So you have six decades of life where, yes, your maxillary sutures do mature, but never full fusion, and they can be remodeling at different ages. So you have a wonderful opportunity to remodel the maxilla sutures, and when you do, it does change the nasal cavity because it's... The, the maxilla makes up the floor and the walls of the nasal chamber. So to literally say uh, the maxillary sutures fuse at age 12 or 14 or puberty or girls are before boys, that's all correct and a myth. And you just have to get out your bone dynamic textbooks. Most of it boils down to the mechanical basis of bone formation by J.H. Scott, which was published like 60 or 70 years ago. And that's all about the cycling of pressure and tension. Bone grows by cycling pressure and tension. And if you want to see a maxilla grow, you just have to have a cycle of pressure and tension somewhere during the first six decades of life to show it in the maxilla. The idea there is um, we might have just learned, a, you know, a short story in dental school that was more like a myth than a reality. And those in dentistry a long time have recognized, well, there are a few things that we might have learned in dental school that weren't as accurate as it, they could have been. All you need to do is get some orthopedic textbooks and start reading about the differences between skull bones and maxillary bones. And they're totally different worlds. Even though they're connections, they're totally different worlds. Unbelievable difference. Can you do expansion on an adult patient with bone loss? Sure, because you're trying to solve their problem. The adult patient that has bone loss has a malocclusion of the underdeveloped variety. And more often than not, it's the malocclusion causing bone loss. 
So you're looking to develop the arch and give that patient upright vertical with vertical load so they can get out of the horizontal occlusal chondrin. You're looking to give them more tongue space so they can breathe better because more tongue space and better breathing means less clenching and grinding. So if you think about your patients that have bone loss and the more you pay attention to that bone loss, the primary reason for the bone loss is the underlying underdeveloped set of jaws. And so if you asked me 20 years ago, you know, why do patients have bone loss? I would have said, well, it's, well let's see, it's probably poor hygiene. And then it's probably um, poor diet. We'll go with sugar content of diet. And then we'll sprinkle in the genes for it. And I would have said 20 years ago, give, you know, go with those three things as good causes of periodontal bone loss. You know, we'll go with the poor hygiene, the poor diet, and, and you got genes in the family. And none of that is accurate anymore in my world. It's your underdeveloped jaws, it's your poor occlusion, and your poor breathing. And so once you have the poor occlusion, you're under occlusal trauma day in and day out. So now your teeth are, are now in a chronic deterioration state of occlusal trauma. That's contributing to bone loss the most. Your poor tongue space and nasal chamber deliver poor breathing, which triggers the, the airway mechanism to have oral cavity muscles fire. Next thing you know, you're clenching and grinding. So now you're overusing a system that's got occlusal trauma. So in the end, the underdeveloped malocclusion is the path to periodontal loss. And the best thing you can do for those patients is open up those arches and develop a beautifully vertically loaded occlusion with more tongue space and better breathing. Now you can take that patient out of all that extra clenching and grinding, but also remove the hardly loaded occlusion trauma. Next thing you know, you can stop the periodontal loss dead in its tracks. Think about the patients who say, I you know I do the brushing, the flossing, I'm caring for my teeth and I don't eat sugar that much. I'm not you know, sucking on cookies all night long, but here I've got this trouble. It's not likely in their habits or in their food. It's more likely it's occlusal trauma. So we, we treat our perio patients with growth and development, get a better occlusion, get more tongue space. It's an answer you can cause them. Okay. If using expansion, will a beginning deviated septum spontaneously correct itself during childhood growth? Oh, well, better in the early years. So the younger you treat the child and the quicker you get your musculature, you know, behaving and functioning properly, the better that'll resolve. So when you send the child to get an ENT scope and they say, oh yeah, there's a size of the adenoid and a size of the tonsil and there's a slight deviation of the septum. Nothing gets taken care of except growth and development, myofunctional therapy, frame revisions, nasal hygiene. Then you can reevaluate a year or two later and go back and learn, hey, the tonsils and adenoids are smaller and the septum's no longer deviated. So you're more likely to see those quality changes in the younger population. You can still have some reduction in the size of the adenoid and tonsil with teens and adults just by converting mouth breathing to nose breathing. Turns out the size of the tonsil and adenoid is usually driven by the mouth breathing. So if you convert someone from mouth breathing to nose breathing, you'll get some shrinkage. There are people who have kissing tonsils and or class three adenoids that, that are so big, they occupy two thirds to three quarters of the space. So on rare occasion, we do ask those to be removed for better breathing, depending upon the sleep diagnosed, but only rarely. We're not in the habit of removing contents because the research is overwhelming that the removal doesn't supply the risk we're looking for the patient out of their OSA diagnosis. So we're looking to grow the foundation in a way that will you know, remove a technique of having a septum corrected. Now the good news in kids is, no ENT is going to create it except for the child. So there's no way they'll do it, which is wonderful because that's not indicated in a child or even a teen. You would want to wait till it's a fully grown adult. You get involved early, there's a chance you're not going to have to do that correction later on. Terrific. So I think that's all the time we have for our q and I appreciate everyone's questions. They're very thoughtful and uh, everyone benefits from learning from them. A lot of the questions um, do ask how people go about doing this. So I'm going to just go ahead and share my screen. Um, let me just make sure you can see me because I'm working with a couple of monitors here. Slideshow. Okay. All right. So we did the Q&A here. I just need to move this over to my front screen. There we go. Can you, can you everyone see? Yes, <laughs> just a nod would be good. I know last time I didn't have it as uh, in order. Okay, 
Can everyone see the mini residency? A nod. Okay, good. So we're so excited that we have our upcoming mini residencies with Dr. Moralia, who teaches his techniques uh, in our mini residency course. A lot of these questions start with how, 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 how. And unfortunately, we don't have, you know, 20 hours to tell you that. Um, and that's why we created our mini residency. We do have two seats open for our pediatric mini residency this Friday that will get sold out as it has been in the past. Our adult mini residency is September 23rd. You can take both or you can take one or the other and you can mix and match these dates. Um, we go to our website for our upcoming um, dates for 2023, but we just put on the schedule February's dates, the 3rd and the 10th, for those who like to plan in advance. This is where um, Dr. Moralia teaches his tried and true techniques of expansion therapy in children and in adults. So you'll, all your how questions will be answered then. Someone asked what's uh, Dr. Moralia's favorite um, myofunctional therapy course. We're really thrilled to have both Brittany and Carice on board with our team Myo. We, we combined forces and they have different options for different types of learning. So please visit our website and go directly to the Myo page. You'll have more information on that. We do have a couple of spots open for our two-day course, which starts on Friday. You would need to register by tomorrow for sure so we can um, get you everything you need in time and then we also have an eight-week hybrid course uh, launching in October. We also have existing courses for the existing Mayo so please feel free um, to check that out and, and any questions. If you don't have an existing myofunctional therapist, uh, we do provide virtual myofunctional therapy. So please contact me and we can set you up with Brittany Sierra. She's wonderful with the telehealth. Um, if you're not already signed up, we, we have a lot of, of uh, seats taken up already for our Airway Palooza. We are so thrilled to launch this and it's live. In fact, we're giving you a v VIP invite tonight. Um, if you go to our website, we have James Nestor as our keynote speaker and you can see all these familiar faces. Most of them have been on our conversation series at one point or the other or will be in the near future. But this is gonna be an amazing event. Right now it's for um, Airway Dentist, Pediatric Dentist, Dentists, orthodontists um, only, but you can get a virtual team ticket for all the um, team and my functional therapists who want to join uh, virtually. So you can reach out to me more about that. But please take advantage of our AP, um, our VIP savings with this link here, airwayhealthsolutions.com, AP VIP. This will expire September 30th. Uh, we have our vendors. If you're interested in being a vendor, we like to spotlight them. They're going to have a great um, audience there. So uh, reach out to me for more information on that. But thank you to Light Scapel Sleep Group Solutions. And we have our advanced mini residency with Dr. Kevin Boyd. There were a lot of questions tonight on early childhood um, expansion therapies and how to go about doing that and integrating that into your practice. Dr. Boyd is, is probably the goat of, of pediatric dentistry with expansive orthodontics. And he has his uh, live course January 27th and 28th in um, Pompano Beach area. Please check that out. It's a two day course. Dr. Moralia is also gonna be part of that as well. So together they're gonna be a powerful combination to help you treat those early um, childhood kiddos. We talked a little bit about um, techniques with brackets and wires, especially in older teens uh, and fixed expansion in those above 12. We do have an advanced course and we highly, highly recommend you taking the first mini residency prior so you have that basic knowledge and then you want to extend your portfolio to be able to offer um, advanced techniques to this age group. So that's going to be March 3rd and March 4th. It's 100% virtual. Someone asked about our TMD course with Dr. Michael Gelb. We will be launching that again, March 31st. We had a great first course last year and uh, we'll be doing this annually because it's a great um, tool to have in your toolbox to prepare um, the ortho patient by treating the acute TMD patient to get them into ortho. So that is an other must see event. So add that to your calendar. Whenever you take our mini residency, we put you on our locator and it's really been booming. I get asked daily uh, for airway dentists in my area, um, even in Canada. We are branching out to global. So we're really excited about that. And what we're really excited about is just all the children, especially that we're touching and all of the um, adults that we can help breathe, sleep and thrive. 
hopefully we'll all see the majority of you at uh, the AAPMD AOSH Collaboration Cures meeting. We're a proud sponsor. So please come by and see our booth and we will give you a special gift. But we're also launching our airway aligners to the public. So come learn a lot about that. We have a great special going. We're really excited about this venture because the techniques that Dr. Morali is talking about is built into the software. So um, we have a lot of uh, fun surprises in this um, area and we look forward to launching this next week at the AAPMD. The appliances that Dr. Moralia showed today were all from Ohlendorf Appliance Laboratory. So we're um, powerful partners with Kevin. Uh, so if you have any questions, uh, you feel free to reach out to Kevin. And he is great at getting Dr. Ben Moralia's techniques into the appliances that he specially makes for Dr. Moralia. So he's a really key partner and we thank him for everything he does. Once you become part of our alumni, if you would, you're able to join our Airway Dentist Facebook group. If you're already an alumni and haven't joined, please do so because you will get a lot of tidbits and we're actually having our town hall meeting where you have a one-on-one -on -one with Dr. Morales. nice small group. Um, it's just a meeting, a Zoom meeting, very casual where we do this every time, um, every quarter. So you can have your questions asked by Dr. Moralia directly. And if you're not an, an alumnus, alumni yet, please join our Facebook group just for the general um, professional public at Airway Health Meetup. This will all be in a follow-up uh, email, so you don't have to worry about writing everything down. Our upcoming conversations, Let's Talk Mayo, September 28th with Brittany uh, Sierra Murphy and Carice Laguerre. And then October 5th, it's actually Orthodontic Health Month. So what better way to share that and spend that than with Dr. Brett Christensen, who's also on uh, this call. So we really look forward to that. Uh, in November 2nd, we're going to have early childhood case reviews so you can see for yourself firsthand the work that Dr. Kevin Boyd is doing. And then January 18th, Dr. Michael Gell will talk about just demystifying TMD and shedding a light a little bit on his course. We are proud to um, have a powerful partner that we just joined with is, is Nearman Practice Management. I'm sure you all know Anna Nearman's and um, it's a it's a great, um, they have a great resource to help with the medical billing, especially with the TMD. And we just don't offer that. So, you know, we like solutions. That's why we call ourselves Airway Health Solutions. So we reached out to partner with Nearman and they're offering um, this group tonight, a special code to get 50% off um, their setup fee. So please look into Nearman, uh, www.nearmanpm.com and find out more about that to help you with your solutions at the medical billing. They do an amazing job. So that's a, that's a lot of updates, but it seems like more and more that we we're adding and we're really thrilled and we really appreciate you being here tonight. Um, uh, for those who are joining us in the Airway Dentist uh, um, town hall. We're going to log off this and jump back on in the link. It's in our Facebook chat or check your email. And again, this was really a wonderful night with a lot of information. Thank you. Thank you, Ben. I really appreciate everything you do. And uh, if you have any questions, please feel free to reach out. We're here to help you on your airway journey. And it's been a great night. Thanks, Thanks everyone. Thanks.